Welcome to House of Faith and welcome to this Give Me Liberty Tour. We are absolutely blessed by you being here. And we think of you as the people who are going to make a change in this culture, a change in our nation. You may not realize how important you are, but God has a hold of you in such a manner that you can make a huge change. And we can get the traditional freedoms that America once had coming right back to you and me. And it's a privilege for to have you here today. I want to just open in prayer before we move forward. So if you just close your eyes for a moment. So our Father in heaven, we come to you this day as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but also as a citizen, as citizens of this great land, the United States of America. And you have given us a government based upon your sacred truths. A government that has been instituted for us and which derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. And you desired for us to have a government whose core is that all men are created equal. Yeah. And that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable among which are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. And we thank you, Father, that you loved us enough and you love the rest of the world enough that you had this nation founded and founded upon Judean Christian principles by which we can become a lighthouse unto the rest of the world, shining the light of Jesus Christ into all the dark areas of the world and bringing life and liberty and freedom to all men else all over the world of all, and all of all time. We thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege that you've granted unto us, a privilege to live in this great land. And tonight, tonight, this is a time when we face reality and face the fact that the enemy, the greatest enemy, is always the enemy within. And that power of evil works in the hearts of men and women who do not understand what they may lose if they do not take this land back and get it back on the right track. Right. And so now, so, so now we dedicate this time to hearing the words of men who have experienced things that we need to know about and who will encourage us to become the people that you want us to be and will give you the praise. I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 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 We have our rock star with us. Now, you know, Ken has been a friend. Uh, you know, I know a lot of his background. Uh, he, he does a lot of things. He's on boards, uh, some of the most significant boards uh, in the country. NRA, Thunder Board. Uh, he has been mayor of the city of Cincinnati, treasurer of the state of Ohio. His wife has been a principal and superintendent of schools in Cincinnati. Uh, he travels the world overseeing foreign elections. Uh, this guy, and very critical part of Family Research Council. He lectures at Liberty University. I could go on and on and on, but the most important job he has is he happens to be a trustee of the Timothy Clan. Amen. Uh, and uh, he just blessed us. Uh, that is the firm that, that we did found 20 years ago. Uh, uh, please welcome my friend, Ken Blackwell. Amen. sister in Christ is a delight for my wife and I to be here. I was looking for her, my bride of 46 years, <laughs> my girlfriend for 50 years. We are delighted to, to be with you. I want to just pick up on the very excellent presentation and bringing of the word that we just heard. I want to put it in a personal context and then put it in a broader context as to what the challenge is before us. But I don't want to leave the biblical frame of reference. I will, in fact, <coughs> buy the last speaker some time by not drilling through word for word, but giving you some homework. 
The first that will set the frame around my remarks is from John 3. Those who would do evil love the darkness. The second point of reference in the Bible is Matthew 5, where we're told that we're not to put our light under a bushel, but to put it on a candlestick and illuminate so we can bring awareness to the power and might of our God. Amen. The other reference is the story of Nehemiah. And when Nehemiah sent out that clarion call, like we just heard, it was, come, let us build together. It wasn't, come, let us find fault with one another. It wasn't, come, let us tear down. It was, come, let us build together. Amen. And there were a band of naysayers, Sam Ballot, Getchum, and that crowd, who in fact were doubters as to what could be done. But as what we just heard is that God gives us a clear path and a clear prescription for what else is. The other reference, and I, th I think it's important, is Psalms 11, verse 3. There's a question there. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? That is the question before us. That was the question that was just underlined for us. We cannot retreat to the sidelines. As Christians, we must be on the front lines Amen. of this battle. Now, I want to give you just a personal story. I had a great uncle. His name was D. Hart Hubbard. I bet you no one in this room has ever heard of D. Hart Hubbard. <laughs> but D. Hart Hubbard was the first black American to win an Olympic gold medal in track and field. Oh, yeah. He did it in the 1924 games in Paris. He won his gold medal in the long jump. But that year, he had qualified to compete in three events. The 100 yard dash, the long jump, and the high hurdles. And he had been in a transatlantic debate with another fellow who I bet you have heard of. And his name is Eric Little. Yeah. Eric Little, made famous by the chariots of fire. They were to find out which one of them was the fastest human being on the face of the earth. But when Uncle Dehart got to Paris, he was told that he could not compete in the hundred or the high hurdles because they were white only events. Aww. And he didn't compete, but he competed in the long jump and won his gold medal. But when he got back home and he talked to my mom's generation, he, in fact, was a gifted intellectual. He went back and he said, you know, there was a third century philosopher, theologian, who once said that God sometimes writes straight with crooked lines. Mm -hmm. That sometimes God puts you in a position or in a place where you don't understand why, mm -hmm. and it seems like a momentary defeat, but in the scope of things, you find that it was in fact a strong message and you were actually in the right place. Amen. He said God showed him through his not being able to run the power of faith. He said because Eric Little chose not to run because the finals of the 100-yard dash fell on the Sabbath. And Eric said no. 
He could have run to worldly glory and gotten that gold medal, but he chose what became our family watchword or phrase, and that was fidelity to faith. Amen. And that's another point that was underscored by that wonderful message. That we, in fact, have an opportunity to show our fidelity to our faith. Amen. There's a book called Megatrends, written by a guy by the name of uh, John um, Nesbitt. And in that book, he talks about, in a chapter, high tech, high touch. And he said that high tech was moving, technology was moving so fast that it was giving us infinite possibilities. But that as we, in fact, found those infinite possibilities within our reach, we were losing the human touch, mm -hmm. yeah. that we were becoming more and more isolated. Mm -hmm. And in his chapter, High Tech, High Touch, he said, what will once, what will eventually be learned is that in order to take advantage of the possibilities provided by high tech, is that people will remember to engage and high touch. Mm -hmm. The struggle that we have politically, the fight for the soul of our nation is taking place in a number of places. It's taking place on the streets through direct action. And for years, there are groups of us who marched in front of abortion clinics week after week after week, taking a stand for life and the pro-life ethic. And it's had an impact. The battle is in the courts. The battle is also in state, local, and national legislatures. And that means that you must be engaged politically. But the fourth arena, an arena that is also often forgotten, but so important to the high touch strategy is person to person, Christian to Christian, Christian to the unchurched. But it is a matter of personal involvement, personal engagement. And that's part of our message to you. You see, our challenge is to encourage you to show your fidelity to God's word, your fidelity to your faith by not going to the sidelines, but to the front lines. I've been blessed. I've been the mayor of my hometown. I've been a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations in charge of the human rights portfolio. And in that capacity, I had the opportunity to meet a small person in stature, Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa did two things that I want to share with you because it will help in preparing you to engage in the way that we're encouraging you to get involved. The first was that every night Mother Teresa did what she called the examination of her hands. She would talk to her hands. Where have you been today? Who have you helped today? Have you helped the sick? Have you held a baby? Have you read to a child? What have you done today? The second thing that she said to a small group which will ever stay with me is that she once was asked how she saw herself. And she said, I see myself as a pencil. And everybody sort of looked, a pencil? 
She said, I see myself in a, as a pencil in the hands of God so that he might write love letters to the world. And what that said to me was that each of us, as a child of God, is an instrument of God to carry forth his will and his word. Amen. And that's our obligation. Just think about it. I grew up in a family, my dad was a meat packer, my mom was a GED graduate, went on to be a practical nurse. She was, had an insatiable appetite for reading. And I want to tell you about two, two books. The first was a book that I read when I was nine years old. I had the mumps. It was a book given to me by my grandmother, who was a day a housekeeper for four families. And it was about a little boy, and his name, I can't remember, but his story is written in indelible ink in my memory. It was a novel, but it was a moving story. He grew up and he spent most of his time in the early 1900s in infirmaries. And one night, the nurse came into his room. And she said, little boy, what are you doing? It was dusk. And the little boy had his face plastered against the window pane. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm watching the man punch holes in the darkness. He said, what? He went, she went to the window, and what this little boy was watching was the street, the lamplighter, going down the street lighting lamps in the early 1920s. And for him, in the little boy's mind's eye, the man was punching holes in the darkness. And I want you to hold that. I want you to hold that picture in your mind. Because the second book, it's a little book, and it's part of a little book, and in this book with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are some very powerful words. The second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. My dad, a blue collar meatpacker said, that means that any idiot should be able to get this. <laughs> Self-evident truths. <laughs> that all men are created equal. Amen. And that didn't mean that we were all equal in size, in intelligence, and in wealth. But we were all equal, as you said, that we were all fashioned in the image of God. Amen. And that we were all accountable to the same creator. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which means that there is not a government on the face of the earth that can give you your human rights. Your human rights are not grants from government they are gifts from God. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, given to us in a particular order. The wise men and women of our family, they understood it. They just look. It is pretty difficult to pursue liberty if you're dead. That's right. <laughs> so the first obligation is to protect life. human life. Yes. Amen. Amen. Those of us on the front lines for life have to in fact understand that we cannot retreat
from engaging the political order. That's right. We have to change it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it is pretty difficult to pursue happiness <laughs> if you're not free. Yes. Right. Now you can be chained by health, by ignorance, by slavery, by a whole host of, of, of things. But our job is to protect life, advance liberty, and understand that God has given us a free will. You see, we are not free to do anything that we want. It's been told that we are free to do what we ought. Amen. That is the difference between those who are lawless and those who understand the laws of God, the laws of nature. So ladies and gentlemen, here's the simple message. We are at a point in American history where there is a cloud of darkness. The question is, what will we do? Will we put our lights under a bushel? Or will we put it on a candlestick? Will we band together? Will we rush the darkness? And as that little boy saw the lamplighter do, are we willing to punch holes in the darkness of our time and give glory to who it is due? Amen. Our God. 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 Amen.